Ahoy! Welcome everyone. This is Bertalan Meshko and I'm the Medical Futurist and a very warm welcome to you all who are taking part at this live Q&A session here on YouTube, like every one month. I sit down with you to have a lively, vibrant discussion and every time I have something prepared for you. And this time I have two new things to share, two things we at the Medical Futurist are very excited about. The first is the topic of today's live Q&A that I will talk about the top 100 companies in digital health and, and artificial intelligence in healthcare that we at the Medical Futurist think that should be highlighted. And then these are the companies that are worth watching in 2024. I will talk about them, how I selected those companies, why we select these companies year by year. And I will dive into a, a few of the major topics uh, and categories of these companies like AI or portable diagnostic devices, digital health and so on, and why those fields matter. But the second thing I'd like to share with you is something that make, made us, all of us at The Medical Futurist, very proud and excited. This is it. Finally, it arrived. We have 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is simply extraordinary and unbelievable. For such a you know dedicated topic and channel, it's something we have been just dreaming about to reach that number. But now we have about uh, 105,000 subscribers. Last week, we reached that 500K number and we will get the silver YouTube award quite soon. If you might have been wondering, maybe not, why I have been having this empty space here. Well, for that award. So I hope that it will have a great place uh, for that. So all of you on the chat, welcome. It's great to see that it's quite an international community again today. And it's so good to see, so great to see all of you coming from uh, every part of the globe. I hope that we will have a good discussion here and we can discuss all these 100 companies. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, for subscribing to the Medical Futurist YouTube channel, for watching the videos even just for a few seconds in the last couple of years. We launched this channel over 10 years ago now. And um, we started with very long videos about the future of cancer care and, and advanced technologies. And after 405 videos and about 50 or 100 short YouTube videos, we are finally here, passing the 100,000 subscriber threshold and on to the next 100K or even more, we will see. We are doing our absolute, our absolute best, of course, to reach those numbers, but plus numbers don't matter that much. But this is an important threshold that shows that the channel is appreciated and I'm really grateful to all of you for that. But today is not about celebration and celebrating the channel, but about uh, demonstrating the 100 digital health and AI companies that we shared with you not so long ago. Let me share the the actual list with you. I mean, it's not a list, it's an infographic, but um, every year for since uh, 2017, I've been personally selecting those companies that I think are worth watching. And every year, um, just let me describe it in a few seconds, every year I spend the first few weeks spending countless hours for going through press releases, company announcements, checking the background of companies, the studies they have published, the patient outcomes, the results that they share, and their social media accounts, of course, I try to find out which ones are really standing out of the crowd because there are so many of them. You know, every company is doing remote care and, of course, AI these days. But which are the ones that, that are worth watching? That's uh, that's a big challenge I try to tackle um, in the beginning of every single year. And this year, after careful consideration, maybe before even showing you the actual list, I should show you and share some of the details based on which I select these companies. We, of course, shared all these in this article on the medicalfuturist.com. I will share the link with you in a second. But basically, I, I always look for companies that have a mindset for innovation, that represent or develop truly disruptive technologies, that have a viable business model. So it must be a company that's working well enough. And they must have a clear dedication to digital health. Many of these companies have technologies that share data, not just with medical professionals, but also with patients. But some of these are focusing on very particular areas. So here is the, the companies I've been talking about, and I hope that, and I look forward to your feedback, whether you can see it well enough. But um, again, just one more jump here. I would like to share 
the link to the article and the link to the infographic with you so you can look at the same thing that I'm looking at but in high resolution and in the meantime um, welcome everyone from Canada from uh, Texas from Nepal from England from India it's great to see you all here and Ramjara Ram Raja Bastakoti, thank you for uh, the, the kind words about the 100k. Natasha also, many thanks for the kind words. So again, the 100 companies. Here they are, and now I think you can also look at the same thing. Well, um, there are fields or categories that stand out. The green one is for health management. The brown is for digital health devices. The, the, the blue one is for AI. And this purplish, bluish part is for remote care. These are the biggest categories. But as you can see, there are overlapping uh, companies and categories. The reason why is that I assign a major, a primary category to each of these companies. And I also assign a secondary category to provide a, you know, a more in-depth uh, image or picture about where these companies are operating. But for example, there are individual categories like medication management or 3D printing, clinical trials, maybe education, rehabilitation, virtual reality, digital therapeutics. And I know, look, let's discuss it. I know a lot of companies are missing. And if you have a company, I know that company is missing, you know, especially that company is missing. I know. I just, I have to select 100 out of the thousands and these are the ones that are worth watching for 2024. It doesn't mean that the other ones are rubbish. It just means that I think, I personally think, these are the ones that are worth to watch. Okay, just I, I put this on the table. Now, back to the, the content here. Um, health management stands out as the biggest primary category, but some of the health management companies like um, Auto Health, Dialoop, Path AI also belong to AI. Some of the others like iDoc24, Natural Cycles also belong to remote care services. And the, the big bunch on the left, like Metronic, Omron, Aura, of course, they, they also belong to the digital health devices category. And uh, there have been some, some changes. And in the article, you can find uh, our description and explanation why there is a rising tide of AI, the challenges in VR and 3D printing and how some companies vanished from last year's list why it's important to be successful at doing only one thing, but doing that one thing well. And that's sometimes even unicorns like Babylon Health can break their legs. And if you scroll down to the bottom of this article, you will find the list of these companies with their categories. And actually here is the Excel spreadsheet we use to make the infographic with the, the URLs, the web links to the, the, the companies, and even a short description about them. So you are you're more than welcome to browse these companies and these categories and use them as you wish. I will, of course, in the meantime, keep a, a close eye on them uh, because that's my job. And um, hi, everyone. In the meantime, from Indiana, from Brazil, uh, there is no, no category for epidemiology because for, to, for a company to be successful in epidemiology, they must you know, be active in public health. And then to be a digital health, public health company, uh, it sounds quite tricky to me. You know, digital health company is a company that, that provide a technology or develop something that can share data, not just with medical professionals, but also with patients. And public health is normally and usually primarily for medical professionals. Uh, the panel, uh, Ronald, is in the bottom of the link I'm sharing right now. If you scroll down, then you will find this uh, interactive database there. In the meantime, let's start with some questions. Like Tor Fixen uh, asked the question, not you know about this list yet, but it's very relevant. What are the which are the areas or of where AI is expected to make the most impact? I would say definitely those areas where where database and rep and, and repetitive tasks dominate the industry. So administration, of course, is one where generative AI could play a major role. And uh, radiology, oncology and cardiology are the medical specialties that stand out. I, I have been sharing this and I have shared this analysis with you many times before, but this is still the best one that we can stand by. We have a paper here. Let me share that with you. 
That's the, we were the first ones at the Medical Futurist Institute to publish the, a database of FDA-approved AI-based medical technologies. And when we analyzed all these, then we assigned a medical specialty to each, each of these FDA-approved AI-based medical devices. And you can see that radiology, uh, cardiology, and oncology stand out of this crowd. So these would be the, the, the first areas where AI could have quite a significant impact. All right. Paul Cashman has the question, what are the roadblocks in our healthcare system to maximizing the potential of AI? I think as in the case of every digital health technology or innovation, the, the cultural transformation is the one that everyone has to acknowledge that the introduction of AI into the medical team that now consists of patients and physicians is a is an unprecedentedly, unprecedentedly significant thing and a, and a cultural transformation. It leads to new status quo, new roles for physicians and patients. Therefore, I would start with that. And then, of course, a good healthcare leaders should realize what kind of repetitive and database tasks their healthcare workforce uh, has to entail. And then I would try to automate them by using AI-based technologies. And maybe the third one is to make sure that in every way, uh, patients' private precious data will be secured and protected. It's not always possible because it's impossible to develop AI-based technologies without the precious data from patients. Uh, you know, the bet AI is only as good as the data we feed it with, but there are still methods for protecting the data. Just one example is federated learning that would still allow developers to, to merge huge data sets and this way develop really efficient AI-based algorithms, but the, the actual data sets and databases would still remain in the, within the hospital's IT network. So the precious data of patients, medical records, you know, private information wouldn't leave their server rooms per se. All right. Ronald, Lorenzia, this. do you believe generative AI will reduce patient flow for, for clinicians? Um, okay, let me share the question with everyone. So I'm the only one reading it. As they will do self-medicine. I don't think that it will reduce patient flow, but it will definitely reduce the, the administrative and communication burden on medical professionals, simply because they won't have to answer very basic questions. Just one example, a uh, primary care physician won't have to explain for the 1,000th time how a certain vaccine works because patients will be able to ask these questions quite reliably to large language models and they will get answers they can live by and that will be even maybe either supervised by medical professionals or the, the large language models will be trained on medical databases. So there will be evidence in the background that th these can be used for medical and healthcare purposes. And this way, the burden would be reduced but not the actual patient flow. I think it will remain, it will remain almost the same. All right. Ooh, wow, you have such amazing names. Aureli Soria Frisch shared this question. What role uh, AI plays, I guess, in the validation of digital health outcomes? It's a weird question to ask. I don't think AI has to play a role in validating digital health outcomes because the rules of evidence-based medicine should apply when assessing those outcomes. But if the question is about, well, if the question is about that, then this is my answer. If the question is about whether AI can play a role in validating those outcomes, then maybe when the data sets are too big to be um, handled by you know human beings, researchers and clinicians, then AI could play a role. But even the way AI would handle the databases should be based on an evidence-based background. So it's quite a tricky issue to tackle. Okay, next one. Uh, it's a long question, but I will cut it in half. It's coming from Linda O'Neill. What is your opinion on the productization of AI solutions being brought forward by the top 100 companies? Well, the hardest part for me when selecting these companies, and let me share the, the companies list again with you, was when I, I tried to find out which ones stand out in the AI field. And as you can see here, 
uh, there are ones like Clarius, Econus, and Butterfly Network in the middle, which are focusing on AI-guided ultrasound. There are some with, the, with the, the green and blue ones about health management and AI. There are some like skin checking applications and medical chatbots. So they are focusing on remote care and AI. Arteris is involved in medical imaging. And of course, you know, I could have chosen 15 companies in medical imaging, but I chose one because they stand out of the crowd. They have the biggest amount of FDA approvals and the, maybe the biggest amount of studies backing their technological claims. So it, it has been a struggle to, to choose these AI-based companies. And of course, the top 100 company, you know, all of them cannot be AI focused because digital health has still uh, plays still a bigger role in the whole ecosystem than AI companies, but it's getting there. And Nuance Communications from Microsoft, for example, they are more and more involved in the generative AI space. So even the, the newest, you know, breakthrough technologies are coming through and becoming available. Okay, next one. Uh, Billy Poon asked this question. What is a good area to start for students who is who are beginning to look in this field? Well, um, I know it's not fair to uh, suggest a course that I designed, but simply this is the best kind of resource I can think of because I've spent and we have spent the Medical Futurist countless hours um, designing that course. And this is Introduction to Artificial Intelligence in Medicine and Healthcare. I shared the link with you in the chat. I think it takes about six to 10 hours to complete the course. It's a full day course, sort of, but you can do it at your own pace. But otherwise, besides that, I think um, there is one skill that stands out and that is called prompt engineering. And I also share a link with you in the chat, which is about a paper I published uh, recently in which I argue through a tutorial that prompt engineering is an emerging essential skill for medical professionals. Prompt engineering basically means that you know how to design prompts, you know, text briefs for large language models to get the absolute best outcome. And I even shared um, this uh, like cheat sheet for using ChatGPT for healthcare and medical. Oh, I haven't shown it to you. This cheat sheet for uh, using ChatGPT for medical and healthcare reasons. And this is the paper that I just, I just um, shared with you. It was published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research recently. Okay, next question is from Shivani. Can you please throw some light on Indian AI platforms for primary care physician? Uh, Shivani, I have, I have no super, super vision over country specific, uh, especially medical specialty and country specific AI platforms. So I'm not aware of any, I'm sorry about that. Uh, in country like it is possible to revolutionize healthcare with the help of technology and AI, that's what we have been talking about at the Medical Futurist for 15 years. And you can find countless articles and analysis about this on medicalfuturist.com. Uh, Sheila, why do entrepreneurs need software developers? Well, uh, I guess the question implies that the field is digital health or, or healthcare AI where you need to develop a technology and entrepreneurs, if they don't know how to develop these technologies, they have to hire engineers and developers who do. I think that that's how simple it is. And as healthcare is becoming more and more technology oriented or technology focused, then it's inevitable that uh, these companies will have to employ not just medical professionals and clinicians and researchers, but also technologists per se. On, on Lara, do you see a time when individuals are incentivized to use AI for their medical care by passing consultation with a medical professional? It's a very, very smart question to ask. I don't see this happening, but I see the incentivization happening in a way that patients will be prompted or not pressured, maybe um, motivi motivated or, or inspired to, to use AI. There was a story quite recently that uh, someone went for a mammogram in the US and they were told that for 40 more dollars, an AI could provide an additional analysis besides what the radiologist would provide. So I, we just wrote an article about this, that whether patients will have to pay for the, the AI that they are using. Here is the link to the article we published on the subject. 
Yeah, Natasha. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. Absolutely. Even in STEM fields, prompt engineering is not just something medical, but I argued in the paper that it's an emerging skill for physicians, but it can be used by everyone in the world and in any, actually, any industry. Uh, Ronald, that's a good point that the list and my articles or our articles don't mention many Asian companies. Um, I still keep an eye on Asian companies and there are, I, I always share um, news and, and, and press release announcements about advances in Asia, but those mostly about hospitals reaching like cybersecurity levels or um, implementing generative AI like the, the Chinese uh, hospital I shared a few days ago. Those not mostly about companies, but more about healthcare institutions. And as this list is about companies and not institutions, Maybe that's why it's missing uh, some of the major Asian players. But regarding healthcare hubs, like the question is from Ronald, are there any important Asian healthcare hubs? Um, I would look for those countries where um, consumerism is rising, like Japan and South Korea, where there is a big incentive, a big need for the employment of digit, uh, the impli yes, <laughs> of uh, digital health uh, and AI based companies. Britney Starr, uh, just wondering if you were looking at education of all healthcare providers or just focusing on education for physicians when reviewing these companies. Well, if we look at the list again, let me bring it for you. I think within education, we have like two, three, four companies. One is in, involved in augmented reality, one is in mixed reality, one is in health management and one in virtual reality. And, and I'm, I'm sure and I know that because we have been publishing articles about this, there are many other medical education focused companies. But regarding the technology they are using or um, the disruption, the level of disruption they are reaching, these were the ones that that stood out of the crowd for me for 2024, definitely. Oh, that's why you are asking for about nursing education. Well, then you might be interested in an article we published on medicalfuturist.com about virtual simulations. I shared the link in the chat that might you know, provide some directions for further research. Uh, do you see clinical trials being developed comparing AI solutions to standard of care? Oh, I see. Yeah, of course. <laughs> First, I thought that clinical trials that, that implement AI and maybe even you know shifting towards in silico clinical trials absolutely i mean i mean i, sh I share at least two three papers and studies every year every week about this on the medical futurist social media channels that uh, large language models generative ai platforms um, even standard radiology oncology medical decision support um, drug design ai tools are being compared to traditional methods so it's, it's quite um, like a the gold standard these days that these are being compared to each other. Uh, <laughs> do you even, personal question, do you actually invest in chosen companies? Sheila, it wouldn't um, put a good light on me, right? It would be a sort of a conflict of interest to select companies, maybe help raise their shares and their value and then investing into them. So I know I, I, I avoid doing such things. I. I like to keep my conflict of interest, you know, out of the room. So no, no, I don't invest into these companies. All right, next question. Scott Ettinger has a very relevant question. What are the best AI health companies? Well, Scott, here they are. Some of them are in uh, diagnostics and AI or medical imaging and AI, or this is uh, yellow, so it's... Uh, education and AI, or remote care and AI, health management, digital health devices, portable diagnostic devices and AI. So yeah, I think these are the fields that uh, should be highlighted here. Okay. Of course, of course. Uh, and actually, Sheila had this question before. Uh, tips for patients to become AI savvy. Literally, prompt engineering, Sheila. There is there is no a, a skill to be more important than prompt engineering. This is just basically a skill to be able to work 
with these AI interfaces. The more you do it, of course, the better you will become. And if you take those few like tips and tricks uh, seriously that I shared in the in the infographic before in the chat, then you will be. I guarantee you that you will become much better, much better at using large language models. Uh, Jakub Musialek had a question about how I uh, chose those companies, but I think we've covered this before in the article I shared with you. All right, then uh, Lalit Mohanty asks about career, career opportunities in AI validation for medical devices. Well, um, as I have been receiving so many questions about career choices, I finally decided to write an article about that. And in this, I analyzed a lot of different backgrounds where people might be coming from into digital health and AI. So um, I shared the link in the chat to that article right now. Uh, Reshmi Sid Anathan. Is it essential to know prompt engineering as a pharma professional verbing pharmacovigilance and regulatory affairs? It's a very fair question to ask and I'm, I'm glad that you are asking it. I think it is because in some forms, I think you will have to work with generative AI if you want to save time and effort because your company, even though they might be reluctant now or they might be you know, sending out warnings about not using these tools yet, at some point they will have to uh, you know, start using them, implementing them, deploying them into practice because of how much time and effort can be saved by using these tools. Plus the, the target audience you're working with, I'm sure they are using generative AI. So maybe also that's another reason why it makes sense to have a clear picture about how those work. Mari Lopez has a very interesting question. Besides the medical futurist, thank you. What are other good sources of news about innovative health technologies? You are ruining one of the upcoming videos on the medical futurist YouTube channel because I literally recorded a video like a week ago about this. And um, I'm happy to share some of these resources with you. I love the, um, the newsletter from deeplearning.ai and deeplearning.ai in general is just, you know, fantastic. The best resource in, um, in AI in general, all the news the announcements and the weekly newsletter they have coming out on every Thursday is simply brilliant. And sometimes they even cover uh, healthcare and medical based AI news. The other one is that uh, I love the Futurology Reddit community, because even though, you know, these posts sometimes overhype the importance of um, certain technological news, but in all these technological areas, the community still curates the most important ones. And you can find even interesting discussions about these news. So I check this community actually every single day. I also check out mobihealthnews.com and medgadget.com and BBC Future. And I check out uh, the um, Google AI research blog because it's quite uncommon to see such a, a research oriented um, channel to be organized by a technology giant. And this is a fantastic way of allowing or maybe even empowering their researchers to, to come up with the ideas they have been working on and to make it digestible for, for people like me to understand what those technologists have been working on. All right. Next question is around. Oh, of course, Marianne Schultz. It's great to hear that, that, uh, yeah, nursing faculty, uh, you can, you, you're teaching prompt engineering in the research. Great, great, great news to hear that. Pascal Bolla, hello from Canada. Are you aware of companies that use AI to help patients collect and interpret their own health data from different sources? You know what? This would be an absolute, like a no brainer. This would be the ultimate AI interface to develop. But I've seen AI companies and apps focusing on like skin checking uh, applications or focusing on analyzing lab results or maybe analyzing discharge notes and medical records, but not one platform where you can organize all these different data sources. There was one, I remember a very strange attempt at this, like seven years ago, it was called exist.ai or IO. And their plan was to, or their vision was to allow users to obtain data, like 
I allowed my Fitbit account and my Vitings account and my medical record to be merged into one. And they claimed that based on all these data sources, they would keep on providing me with lifestyle insights and tips and suggestions about my health and disease management. But after like one week of merging my data, the, the app came up with the conclusion that I, I take more steps a day if I spend more time walking. So uh, very useful. No, thank you. All right. Okay, we are going through the majority of the question list because some of you have submitted questions even before the live Q&A uh, started taking place and I went through all of them. And I'm happy that, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, Tulio Zonfalim, have you seen any possibility in the remodeling of any traditional medical product or equipment to have an AI solution in the future? Remodeling, a very, very good question to ask. Well, the ECG is a good example for that. I mean, you know, for decades, ECG have been about um, a, a device being on a cart, you know, the rolling cart, providing the results and the outcome on paper. And now um, smartphone connected ECGs and smartwatches with ECG functions can obtain and measure ECG and AI is analyzing the results to provide further assessment about, the, for example, the risk for atrial fibrillation. So it, I think that's a good example how a traditional, maybe even analog technology can be transformed by keeping AI in mind. So in which product lines do you see any possibilities that involve either repetitive and or database tasks at any parts of administration or that involve the generation of data? It doesn't matter that it used to be on paper. If, it, if now it's not on paper, then we have a winner for uh, a potential you know, solution of, being, uh, of using AI to further analyze the data coming from that resource. All right, I think we are getting to the end of this live Q&A. Um, I hope that you have been finding this uh, useful and that you will use that top 100 list uh, just you know, in your research or for making sure that you keep all those companies in mind and you keep on following them because they will come up with something interesting. And of course, we reevaluate every year. Uh, this year, 23 companies got removed from last year's list. So there are 23 new companies in the list. And of course, um, uh, for a reason. Uh, my is there, is there, I guess, AI-based applications for adverse event reporting? I, I don't think so. It would be, it's such a, a delicate part of pharmacovigilance and the whole process of um, protecting patients' data and patients' health that to use an AI in that, you need a lot of evidence to be able to deploy such a technology. So yeah, guys, thank you so much for being with me here today and for asking all those very thoughtful and very kind questions. Again, thank you even so much for being with us on the, the Medical Futurist so we can have now more than 100,000 subscribers. It's because of you that we at the Medical Futurist, 15 people, we keep on producing content for you. You will find the analysis we publish uh, twice a week on medicalfuturist.com, all the videos here on YouTube, all the daily social media analysis about the news and announcements and studies I come across every day on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us on patreon.com slash the medical futurist and you can join quite an exclusive community for which we create even more content that we don't share anywhere else. And you can buy the ebooks we publish on leanpub.com. Uh, let me share the link with you just in case you would get interested. We have uh, four, 13 ebooks and two of them are for free. And I'm very proud of all these executive summaries and ebooks. So please feel free to, to browse, browse among them. Here they are. And just in general, thank you for following us. Thank you for clicking on the links we share. Thank you for watching the videos. We have a huge lineup of, of really exciting content and videos coming up in the next two or three weeks. And I will travel a little bit uh, around Europe mostly for keynotes and conferences. But then I will be back, uh, I think, in the second part of March for another live Q&A session. And if there are any topics you would like to hear more about in a live Q&A session or the topics you think I should dedicate the live Q&A session to, please leave a comment uh, after the video is uh, published, after the live stream is over, and we would be more than happy 
to consider all those suggestions and recommendations coming from you. So again, thank you so much for being with me today and have an excellent day.